In other words, as we explore the work of Langston Hughes, Sterling Brown, Margaret Walker, Melvin Tolson, Robert Hayden, and Gwendolyn Brooks, we will be aware of this fascinating dance between the page and the stage. The urge to meld music with speech and the insistence upon retaining the cultural integrity of their creations in the face of the allure of other familiar and competing traditions. So you have a pen. If you're a writer, you have some power. You don't need, um, you don't need a gun when we think about um, the guy from Fort Scott. Um, Gordon yeah, Gordon Parks. You know, you have a choice of weapons, right? You have a choice of weapons and the pen is probably a most powerful weapon. And you've heard the saying, don't argue with a journalist because <coughs> they have a barrel of ink uh, and they can outdo you. So your students should start to see that when we have these people in, in this era, this nadir, which is slamming black folks down, uh, saying, okay, you know, we have the power now. Uh, we made that Tilden Hayes compromise. So, um, we can do whatever we want. We're going to take the Freedmen's Bureau out. That little bit of time that you had where you thought that you had some power is gone. Uh, and we want you to know that, I mean, that's why they named the period after Reconstruction Reclamation, right? We're reclaiming our rights uh, to power. And you have to tell your students that because otherwise they don't get it. They don't get it. Why is this such a struggle? Uh, why don't they just write? If somebody says to you, well, uh, these writers were not sufficiently uh, taking stances about things. I said, well, did you read everything? Because often that kind of comment is based upon a single instance of that person's work. Not on an understanding of what that person uh, was about as represented through a body of work, even if the body of work is only 12 points, maybe, or whatever. Writers, he insists, must avoid the pitfalls of propaganda, uh, doctrinaire, uh, Marxian leanings, and the like. The task of this younger gen literary generation, he reiterates, is not to ignore or eliminate the race problem, but to broaden its social dimensions and deepen its universal human implications. Well, collectively, these three premises are both prescription and critique. There is the artistic self-proclaimed magical activity in Gwendolyn Brooks's poetry that would transform the narrating self and history. It is a stylistic uniqueness of body and voice that can be terminated in its most material form. Soldiers can be killed during any of several wars during her time, but not in the African-American and human spirit that literally inform her poetic form. While this imaginary is embedded within modern history, especially 1945 to 1968, it is part of a greater racial and human meta-narrative. It is this elusive magic, especially 1945 to 1968, um, so repressed within modernity that her poetry especially reaches for Despite the idealistic notions of such poetry, Brooks often suggests a need for poet, poetic practicality. In other words, a social reconstruction or imaginative, not imaginary, transformation in the real world. But um, you might ask them to uh, think about uh, what goes on in this poem and does it resonate with anything that's, that's occurring even today? So we're, what we're asking students to do in an instance like this without any sort of real preparation, you know, theoretical or critical, is to operate from a sense of their own experience. And so um, sometimes there's a little bit of a danger in that because uh, they can come up with things that seem uh, on the face to us maybe a little bit simplistic, but at least it gives you a point of departure. And then from there you can go into um, 
ways in which maybe even this poem fits into a, a broader context. You see, <laughs> all I ask from my uh, throne of antiquity, which I like to inhabit these days, mm -hmm. <laughs> is that we work together in honesty. And if we say we are interested in African American culture and in culture, in literature and in African American literature, in hip hop or in whatever you know we're interested in, that we acknowledge our own standpoints. From the earliest attempts of African American poets in the 18th century to express lyrically their adjustment to existence in a society that debated their humanity, to the intense exploration of voice in the waning years of a racially charged 20th century. They have built an aesthetic tradition that affirms them and that challenges anyone to deny their voice. Using a language of literary models adopted to meet their cultural purposes, these poets had a very challenging often agonizing set of problems. And I sat at a, a Swarthmore audience and I heard, I heard uh, people in, uh, in that poem sort of laugh at that and think it was cute. Let me tell you, I could never laugh at that poem. No way! Because I knew what the pain in her life was regarding that issue, that poem. The question I raise is, what is protest? And what kind of literature makes a protest? I, I would return to words. From 1930 to 1960, the interposing forces of economic depression, political unrest, Marxism, a world war that took enormous toll in human life, McCarthyism, segregation, civil rights struggle, they all had profound effects on the poets during this particular period. As well, they shared a new humanism that stressed the potential of heroism in the collective. If you didn't get that from all these poems that you, you heard read, you just missed it. You were sleeping, but I think you did. <laughs> heroism. They added their voices of protest, and they responded to the modernity by preserving their cultural traditions and the sites of their own creativity. This need to prove oneself or to prove the race is not new. Uh, and make sure that your students understand that. Uh, this is teaching and reading uh, this literature, so we're going to talk about how to teach it, how to read it, how to teach your students how to read it, okay? If somebody says to you, well, uh, these writers were not sufficiently uh, taking stances about things, I said, well, did you read everything? Because often that kind of comment is based upon a single instance of that person's work, not on an understanding of what that person uh, was about as represented through a body of work, even if the body of work is only 12 points, maybe, or whatever. Um, some people will tell you, and it's entirely a lie, that music is an entirely a, a non-connotative, it's not really a language, you know, it's just sound. Uh, no one in classical music would believe that because we have this whole category, you're in classical music, so you know what I'm talking about. We have this whole category called program music, things like Berlioz's Symphony Fantastique, where they literally tell a story using nothing but instrument, instruments. You hear a particular motif and it comes to play a narrative role. So it's clear that music is not just sound, it is part of a language. Language is not just semantics and syntax. 
by the same token. Broadly honest acknowledgement is very much needed as we seek to put in its place the myth behind the American dream so we can see both the dream and the nightmare. <laughs>